Okay, welcome to this last kind of part of the series in the physics of fluid mechanics. In this next set of videos, in this last set of videos, I want to talk about elasticity. Now, this is pretty important in the study of fluids because let's say you had some, uh, let's say, body of water, and inside of this body of water, you threw in a piece of wood or like a block of wood. We know that as the depth of this block of wood increases, we know that the pressure acting on this block is going to increase, right? The deeper you go down in this body of liquid, the higher the pressure is. Now, obviously, if you go deep enough, the pressure is going to get so strong that it's actually going to start compressing the block. So if the block had a volume of V, the deeper you go down or the deeper the block goes down in this liquid, the block is going to get more and more compressed and it's going to change volume by an amount delta V. Obviously, solids are very strong materials for the most part. And if you submerge them in a body of liquid, they are going to compress, but they're not going to compress a whole lot. They're only going to compress by a very small amount, delta V. Now, if we take delta V and we divided it by the initial volume of that object, this is known as volume strain. Now, in order to understand this relationship of volume strain and how it relates to an object and the liquid and the depth and the pressure and all of that sort of stuff, we have to turn our attention to the actual solid itself. We have to understand how these solid objects behave due to external forces or pressures. So that is what we're going to talk about in this video and the next few videos. And hopefully all of that information will help us to understand this relationship between the volume strain and the object and the fluid. Okay, so where do we start? Well, if you remember from the very first few videos of this series, we were studying water molecules. We were studying the molecular bond between these water particles or these molecules. And we understood that the study of fluids itself is really a study of the collective set of these fluid molecules and how they interact with one another. So in this container, if I were to dump in water and just let that sit over a period of time, you'll notice that all the water molecules would eventually pack close to one another and settle. And we also studied the molecular bonds between these water molecules. So if I were to draw this out uh, into a bigger picture, we would see that each water molecule has some sort of molecular bond with the other water molecules around it. Now, in the case of liquids, these molecular bonds, which are drawn by these little springs between each molecules, they are strong enough to where if you just let the water sit or the liquid sit, these bonds will pull the water molecules close to one another and be in a settled state like this. However, they are also weak enough to where if you put your hand inside of this container and started moving it around, the water molecules would slide past your hand, they would slide past one another. So the molecular bonds are strong enough to where if there's no external force, they would eventually settle like this. However, if you were to apply an external force like your hand or shake the container, these bonds are weak enough to let the water molecules kind of slide past one another. Now we know that liquids are incompressible fluids, which means that the distance between each molecule in a settled state is as close to one another as it can be. So you can't actually push these water molecules any closer to one another, they're incompressible. Now in the case of solids, so let's say I had this block of steel. All the steel molecules have very, very strong bonds. And so these steel molecules, I'll draw that out as well here, just like I did for the liquid. These bonds between each of these solid molecules are extremely strong. And they're much stronger than the bonds here for these liquid or these water molecules. And so the molecular bonds here can remain intact, even if the force moving them is relatively strong. So this right here is the molecular bond. And these circles that I've drawn are the actual molecule. So for solids themselves, all solids, whether they are plastic or steel or metal or concrete, these molecular bonds have a spring-like behavior to them. 
So if you were to pull on these molecules with relative strength, these molecules will move away from each other. But if you let go, those molecules will spring back to their original place. Given that the force isn't super, super strong to where it starts deforming this object or breaks it entirely. So if I were to draw a rod and actually study this, so we'll make another section down here. So let's say I have a metal rod and on one side it's attached to a rigid support and in the other end it's just free hanging. So this is the rod and this is a steel rod and it has a length of L. Now if I were to apply a force to this rod, let's say at the end, this force will cause this rod to elongate a tiny bit and I will call this distance delta L. Now, if we were to study the relationship between this force and how much this rod elongates or stretches, we could do so on a graph. So let's draw a graph here that shows the relationship between delta L and the force. So starting at zero with zero force, as you increase the force, the rod is going to elongate. And up to a certain force, up to a certain point, we know that F is going to be directly proportional to how much that rod elongates. So this symbol that I've drawn here just means directly proportional. So F is directly proportional to the amount that it stretches. Now, if you were to let go of the rod, then the rod is going to go from here back to its original position. And on this graph, that entire region right here is called a linear region. And what that means is that up to a certain point, as long as that force doesn't cross that point, the rod is going to stretch by some amount. And if you let go of the rod, the rod is going to stretch back to its original position. Now, if you were to keep going, in other words, if you were to keep pulling this rod, after a certain point, you'll notice that you don't need as much force anymore to move the rod a greater distance. In other words, this distance right here. And if you were to pull the rod even more, now things start getting interesting because at this point right here, this is where the rod permanently deforms. So a great example of this is a paper clip. If you were to apply a force and bend the paper clip up to a certain force, and then you let go, the paper clip would snap back to its original position. However, if you were to keep pulling on that paper clip or bending it, eventually it's going to deform. So if you were to go past this point, which we call our elastic limit, the paper clip or the rod would permanently deform. So if you let go of the paper clip, it is going to snap back to a position, but that position is not gonna be the original position as it was here at zero. It's gonna stay permanently deformed. And that's where we call the elastic limit, that point. Now, if you kept going and kept increasing the force after it's already permanently deformed, well, this right here is the point where it breaks. So if you were to bend the paperclip far enough to where it went past this plastic deformation, then the paper clip would break. And the same thing goes for this rod. If you were to pull on this rod long enough, after the elastic limit, the rod would be permanently deformed. So instead of going back to the original position, it might go back here and stay there, even with zero force. But if you kept going and increased the force, eventually this rod would break. And this is our breaking point. However, anything past this linear region can get pretty complicated and I don't want to really go into this region right here. I want to focus our study on zero and where this line remains linear. So within the linear region, we know that our force is directly proportional to delta L. So the slope of that line, the slope of the linear region line is going to be, well, rise over run, and that is F over delta L. And this slope is what we call K, our constant K. And you might know this as the spring constant. Now, when we refer to the spring constant, what we're really talking about is the constant that applies to these molecular bonds, the spring-like molecular bonds. Now, you might also know this relationship of the slope of this linear region to be F is equal to K times delta L. 
you might also know that as f equals k x where x is the displacement and this right here is none other than Hooke's law and all it states is that within the linear region f is directly proportional to the amount that that rod stretches by a proportionality constant k now there's a bit of a problem here because this relationship right here depends on the composition of this rod so what the rod is made out of what material it's made out of and it's also dependent on how long the length of the rod is as well as what the cross-sectional area so it's very dependent on the geometry and the composition of the material that we're studying so the question really becomes how can we apply this to materials without really knowing the geometry and the composition and the makeup of this material in other words how can we study the elastic properties or the elastic properties of each of these molecular bonds between particles or molecules without worrying about the geometry of the material itself how do we generalize this how can we generalize Hooke's law and apply it at kind of the atomic scale at the molecular level well that is what we will talk about in the next video so see you then